At Making Medicine, we're reporting on the headlines, not making medical recommendations. For personal health questions, always consult a doctor. Nothing in this episode constitutes investment, financial, or legal advice, and please consult your own advisors before making decisions. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Making Medicine podcast, where science, policy, and innovation meet. As always, I'm your host, John Stanford. Today, we have some headlines to cover as year-end healthcare legislation moves through Capitol Hill and the biotech industry finishes off what's been a wild year. Let's get into the show. Up first, we're going to talk about the annual defense bill, or NDAA, as it's known inside the Beltway. And stay with me here. In name, this must-pass legislation sets the plan for the Pentagon for the following year, in this case, 2026. But in this environment, it's one of the few bills that actually becomes law, or at least has for the last 60 so years. So it always gets loaded up with things beyond just more planes and warships. So while we've talked about biotech in the context of the FDA, CMS, NIH, the health side of government, this year's defense bill is making it clear that Congress views biotechnology not just as a means to making patients healthier, but as a critical asset to national security. The core idea is simple. Biotech is now a strategic capability. The same way we think about semiconductors and AI, we're now thinking about biomanufacturing, synthetic biology, and data as part of the U.S. National Security Toolkit. So it only makes sense that this bill that takes care of our National Security Toolkit touches on a set of biomanufacturing and biotech issues. So let's talk about them. One of the first things that we'll come back to is building at home. The bill makes clear that there needs to be more domestic biomanufacturing capacity, more infrastructure, and more talent. We also need to secure the ecosystem through supply chains, our own biological data, and defense labs. And it wouldn't be a bill in Washington without a conversation about China. And this puts guardrails on China and other, quote, countries of concern, who we buy from, who we partner with, and where our capital goes. Most of this shows up in four places in the defense bill. The first section, the bioindustrial base inside the Department of Defense. DOD actually does a great deal of investment in biotech startups, and that's going to continue under this bill. Later in the legislation, Title VIII, there's a government-wide prohibition on contracting with certain biotech companies. Much later in the bill, Title 66, Biotech Inside the Intelligence Community, and stay with me, in Section 85, there's a new outbound investment regime that could eventually tie into biotech, something that we've been talking about for a while, of would we be limiting U.S. dollars from going to China? Now, biotech's not explicitly named, as we'll talk about, but it sets precedent, and so it's something we're watching. So let's start with that first title, that first section. The bill will fund real-world infrastructure. DOD, which has also started to go by DOW, the Department of War, will get broader authority to support, design, and construct pilot and demonstration facilities so that bioindustrial R&D can translate into actual manufacturing capacity for critical materials, fuels, and other biomanufactured products. I know this is really in the weeds, but these programs eventually become entire segments of industry. The bill also creates a home for biotech inside the Pentagon. There'll be a new biotech management office and a senior biotech lead that's charged with developing and executing a department-wide strategy. That'll be updating acquisition policies, coordinating with industry and allies, and identifying workforce needs. It basically gives biotech a permanent address at DOD. So if you're in the startup ecosystem, this is going to be someone in government that we need to add to the list of who we know. This section is also going to push commercialization and supply chain resilience. New programs are authorized to expand domestic biofacturing, harden defense supply chains, and use bio-based alternatives. They'll also upgrade lab and digital infrastructure. Again, these are investments today that we will see for years to come down the road. It also makes biological data AI-ready and secure. It requires the DOD to standardize that data so it can be used with AI and advanced computational tools, while also planning for secure cloud storage, cybersecurity, and biosecurity protections. 
So not only is the goal of this to protect patient data further, but it's also to ready it for large language models and other AI tools. If Title I is about building America's biocapacity, the next set of provisions is about guarding it, mainly with an emphasis on China. No surprise there. So let's take a look at what the NDAA is doing. Title VIII and 66 first cut off foreign biotechs of concern from federal money. This is basically the Biosecure Act that we've talked about before. The bill is going to implement an updated version of Biosecure. Federal agencies generally can't buy biotech equipment or services from designated, quote, biotechnology companies of concern. Federal grants and loans can't be used to buy from it either. Companies are identified as a company of concern either through placement on the DOD-managed 1260H list or through a new list that will be managed by the director of OMB and updated annually. As we've seen with the Trump administration, these lists, which have been wonky in the weeds for years, can quickly become very relevant to how we do business. As we've discussed on a past episode, designated firms get a notice and will have a chance to respond to try to have this designation removed but that's only on the OMB managed list. Companies on the 1260H list at DOD will not have an opportunity to address or reconcile that. This section also builds focus on biotech inside the intelligence community. It's tough to draw our world of biotech design to three-letter agencies, but look no further than the last Mission Impossible movies. It's clear that this is something that the intelligence community is paying attention to. Key agencies like the ODNI, the CIA, the NSA, FBI, DIA, and even the secure elements of the Department of Energy will appoint senior biotech leads. And the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence that oversees all of this, has to improve how we declassify and share intelligence on foreign biotech threats. The intelligence community is tasked with helping secure our data from exploitation, steering procurement of synthetic DNA and RNA towards trusted domestic providers, and closing intelligence gaps around how China invests and accesses U.S.-originated biotech. Put together, these provisions make clear the U.S. is tightening national security around who we buy from, where our biological data goes, and how deeply we're intertwined with China's biotech ecosystem. Finally, as I mentioned, Title 85 – this last piece isn't written for biotech, so I should be really clear up front. As of right now, biotech is not covered by what I'm about to say, but it should be in every investor and founder's radar because this year's defense bill will create a new outbound investment regime. Here's what it does. First, it creates a formal screen on U.S. money going out, not just foreign money coming in. The NDA incorporates the Comprehensive Outbound Investment National Security Act, or COINS Act, which sets up a system to limit U.S. investments into, quote, countries of concern when those deals touch sensitive technology sectors that could meaningfully boost foreign military capabilities. Second, it focuses on a handful of high-risk tech sectors for now. The initial covered sectors are industries including semiconductors, AI systems, quantum, high-performance computing, and hypersonics. For certain deals in those areas, U.S. investors will have to notify the government, and in some cases, those transactions can be prohibited outright with enforcement and penalties built in. The bill leaves the door wide open for biotech to be added. Here's the catch for life sciences. The law lets the administration add new sectors as covered national security sectors over time. Given everything else in the NDA that we just talked about relevant to China, biological data, and biotech as a strategic capability, it's not hard to imagine biotech or specific subfields being pulled into this regime down the road. So even though biotech isn't formally in the outbound investment crosshairs yet, this is the policy architecture that could one day govern cross-border biotech partnerships, joint ventures, and capital flows. We're not telling investors and the broader ecosystem to hit the panic button yet, but believe this is an area we're going to have to pay attention to moving forward. Some listeners may be familiar with CFIUS, which is a current and longstanding operation at the Department of Treasury that limits the ability for foreign actors to invest in the U.S. for strategic purposes. 
Some are calling the COINS Act and other ideas like it the concept of a reverse CFIUS, that our capital is an asset as well, and that the government wants to have a say in where it can go in these countries of concern. That was a lot. So as a biotech investor or as a leader of a company, how can you be keeping this straight with all the other things on your plate? In wrap-up, the NDAA is going to be both an opportunity as well as a potential constraint on our industry. As an opportunity, doors are opened at the Department of Defense, the largest agency in the federal government, and probably the most critical. So it is clear that biotech strategy is going to be important there. That's going to open the door for funding, partnerships, contracts, especially if you're building domestic, secure, bio-based capabilities. Add in the intelligence community and those additional resources, it could be that the DOD and the intelligence community becomes another catalyst for innovation around biotech, particularly for advanced technologies. But it also can be viewed as a constraint. It's clear that the bill sets up against our adversary in China. It's a time where China, as we have talked about on a number of episodes, is moving forward in the innovative biotech community. There's going to be more scrutiny over who your suppliers are, where your data lives, and who your investors are, both here and abroad. The bill is setting the tone for years to come where we are going to be thinking about the U.S. biotech system not just as something meaningful for patients that has been transforming lives around the world, but it's clear that it's going to become a part of our national security apparatus. We should all consider ourselves warned. For investors, it means that you might see new programs and incentives that make bioindustrial and defense-relevant biotech more attractive. But you're going to need to track blacklists, procurement restrictions, and potentially outbound investment rules that can shape cross-border deal-making. The challenge and the opportunity is figuring out how to harness all this new attention and investment in ways that can accelerate the development of safe, effective new treatments without overcorrecting on security in ways that choke off innovation. We'll keep tracking the defense bill as it moves from text to law to implementation. In the meantime, if you have questions about anything we've covered, because it was a lot, let us know in the comments or reach out to Incubate directly. We will continue to be advocating that we have a strong global biotech community that can work, take advantage of these opportunities, and not put barriers in place of developing new medicines. Our second item today stays right in the same place in Congress. With a new bipartisan bill that sits right at the intersection of biotech and national security, it's the Independence Investment Fund Act. On December 3rd, Representatives Chrissy Houlihan, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, and Pete Sessions, a Republican from Texas, introduced legislation that would create a government-backed, privately-run investment fund housed at the Treasury Department. The focus will be U.S.-based companies working on critical and emerging biotechnologies. You heard that right. This is a bill that would create a fund, a government fund, not quite the size of sovereign wealth funds, but it would be a government fund that is investing in critical emerging biotech. The idea is to attack the classic valley of death between research and commercialization. The fund would make strategic seed and mid-stage equity investments of roughly $1 to $10 million per deal to help de-risk promising technologies so private capital is more willing to pile in. The bill would appropriate just shy of a $1 billion to get the fund off the ground with an explicit goal of bridging the financing gap for high-impact technologies, crowding in private investment, and countering adversarial foreign capital that might otherwise scoop up or steer U.S. innovations. This isn't coming out of nowhere. The National Security Commission on Emerging Biotechnology, someone Incubate has worked closely with, called for exactly this kind of fund in their April 2025 report as a key area for government action. Look no further than the announcement around the bill's introduction, not just from Representative Sessions, but also Reps Khanna and Bice called out national security in why they supported this bill. So it's clear, linking back to the defense bill, that national security and biotech are clearly intertwined in Congress. Last but certainly not least is the ongoing debate around health care and a possible vote in the Senate. The Senate is scheduled to vote today on two competing health care proposals, one from Republicans, one from Democrats, with major implications for coverage and premiums. Let's step back for a second. 
As folks recall, the government shutdown was largely tied to the expiring Affordable Care Act subsidies that went into place during COVID. They made it substantially more affordable. And we've already seen proposed plans for 2026 having double or triple the premiums. And so Americans are beginning to reconcile this idea that the cost of health care is going up. But what is Congress going to do about it is the number one topic in Washington. On one side, Republicans, led by Senators Bill Cassidy and Mike Crapo, are proposing to replace the soon-expiring COVID-era subsidies with direct deposits of $1,000 to $1,500 into health savings accounts for eligible individuals under 700% of the federal poverty line. For reference, the federal poverty line is roughly $20,000, so this would be eligible for people up to about $140,000 of annual income. Democrats are instead pushing for a three-year extension of the expiring ACA subsidies, arguing that the Republicans' HSA plans and payments fall far short of covering the deductibles, which could leave Americans exposed to high out-of-pocket costs and coverage gaps. Both proposals are unlikely to secure the 60 votes needed to pass the Senate, so uncertainty remains. If neither plan gains traction, many of the 24 million Americans who rely on ACA premium subsidies could face steep premium hikes, possibly triggering a major coverage disruption at the start of 2026. One of the reasons new medicines aren't celebrated as we think they should be is because access and affordability discussions in this country have been off the rails for years. Healthcare coverage and healthcare payments continue to upset people on both sides of the aisle because they simply can't figure out that even with insurance, they can't access the medicines, treatments, or doctors without co-pays, co-insurance, taking dollars out of their pockets. With the expiration of these subsidies, for those accessing Affordable Care Act plans, this conversation is only going to get worse. So it's critically important that on both sides of the aisle, policymakers find a path forward that allow Americans to have confidence that when they get sick and their doctor prescribes them a medication or requires a surgery, that they have access in an affordable way to the health care they need. The bad policies that we see that go after the ecosystem that derives so much innovation for patients tend to be tied back to the frustration Americans have that they can't afford their health care. That's why it's critically important that Congress and the president get this conversation right. I know it seems strange to draw connections to what seems to be ongoing battles against biotech with health coverage, but they're one and the same. Americans continue to remain frustrated with what they can access for health care in this country, and that prevents them from celebrating and being excited about the incredible science and innovation that's making medicines. So we'll be standing alongside a number of healthcare stakeholders and hoping to see this path forward, find compromise and common ground so that we can focus on important policies that will allow us to keep pace with innovation around the globe. That's all for this week's episode of the Making Medicine Podcast. Have a thought or question about today's topics? Drop a comment and we'll feature it in next week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn, X, and Instagram using the links in the description. Thanks for listening. And as always, keep innovating.